back to WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and AM1570. We are BaltimorePositive.com. Certainly uh, getting ready for the Maryland Crab Cake Tour this week. We're going to be out at Happis in Cockeysville. We're going to have some great friend, old friends. Dan Rogers from the Baltimore Sun will be joining us, talking about his one-man show. Uh, also going to be joined by David Steele, former Baltimore Sun reporter as well, talking about his new book on uh, sports and race and probably get some Colin Kaepernick in, among some other things. And then real highlight uh, of the holiday for me, Mike Bordick will be joining us on Friday, along with Frank Kalarik from League of Dreams. I keep calling it Field of Dreams. And they're bringing Adam Kalarik over. So we're going to have a real Major League uh, pitcher and a world champion as well. We're going to be at Pappas having Maryland Crab Cakes. All are brought to you by the Maryland Lottery. I'll be giving away some scratch-offs from the uh, Ravens. Maybe you win 50 bucks like somebody did two weeks ago out of Greenmount Station. Also, our friends at Window Nation, 866 Nation. Staying nice and warm in here now that it's cold outside with my new windows. And our friends at Goodwill. I got to give a shout out. Wednesday, my wife and I are rolling the sleeves up. We're going to be serving over 3,000 less fortunate folks on Wednesday morning at the convention center. Uh, all of it sponsored by Goodwill, along with our friends from Wise Markets who uh, ponied up the turkeys to help out uh, and make the holiday even better. My holiday's going well. I got so many great guests on uh, this week. I, I sort of used bye week to go through my hit list of people I've never had on or haven't had on in years. Um, she remembers me somehow. She at least said she did when we did our 10-second green room. She remembers me at the Baltimore Sun. She joined the Sun after I did. I started on January 6, 1986. She came sometime in 1987. She is still there 35 years later. <laughs> Jean Marbella is an enterprise writer, a columnist, and a, a fabulous Baltimore resource. Um, and Jean, I, I'll be honest, you started covering the Peter Angelos, uh, uh, Louis, John, uh, Mama Angelos thing a couple weeks ago. I said, I'm going to get her on, and I, I, I stand embarrassed, and I won't apologize that I've been doing radio for 31 years, and I've never had you on the show. So welcome and thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. This Angelo's case will be going on for some time now. So. Yeah, you know, I, I'm thinking there's not going to be a settlement in this one. If they were all going to take, well, you take a billion, and I'll take a billion, we'll go home. If that was going to happen, that probably would have happened already, right? Yeah, there's a there's some bad blood here, and it's going to take a while for the water to clear. Yeah, well, I had a lot of things to talk about. I mean, the renaming of Port Covington, obviously West coming in and the entire Democratic thing that's going on. Uh, I texted with Heather Mazier uh, last night as well and wished her well uh, that she lost her election, which is very, very unfortunate, not even given my politics, but given sanity. Um, the Angelos thing for you. You're from here. You went to Chicago. You went to a real journalism school. Uh, I went to the <laughs> University of Baltimore. Here you all these years later. Um, the Angelos thing. Obviously, I am the the nemesis of Angelos. I was thrown out 16 years ago. My press <laughs> pass was taken away, giving Chad Steele some bright ideas that he thinks he's going to get away with. Uh, the, the Oriole thing and the, the largest that the Orioles once were. And you were here when... You were here on Fantastic Fans Night when they announced they were building this new Camden Yards mm -hmm. project. They didn't even call it Camden Yards then. Uh, they just called it West Downtown. All these years later, the Angelos thing is, as far as Baltimore stories go, it is just such a Greek tragedy. I mean, all the way around, and he's eating pudding and going to be going away at some point, and his, his legacy is just horrific for what baseball represented to a guy named Aparicio who came here on a boat from Venezuela, you know? <laughs> you know, you're right. It, it does have uh, the elements of a Greek tragedy. You know, I'm not sure what his legacy will be. And, you know, he's still with us, so it's probably premature to say that. But, you know, you have to think back to who owned the Orioles before Angelus. You know, it was a guy from New York who had gone bankrupt. And, you know, it... it, it I think having a hometown guy own the hometown team is is positive. It you know, sounded like something. a good idea at the time. Right, right. And, you know, look at where they are now. We just came off of this great season. You know, there are some high hopes for next season. So, you know, the ball rolls here, the ball rolls there. You know, well, but, I mean, from a baseball yeah. perspective, it's terrible <laughs> that they've been awful. But from right. a human perspective, from mm -hmm. human capital and what that stadium represented and what the mm -hmm. Orioles represented before the Ravens even came here, it was a one right. town, right? Yep. That this Camden Yards was our gateway arch. You, you know what I mean? Right. Like literally right. it was the centerpiece and the crown jewel mm -hmm. of everything downtown right. as 
Governor Schaefer and Mayor Schaefer would have right. envisioned that all these years later, he'd be on his deathbed. People wouldn't be <laughs> going to the games. There'd be a team <laughs> in D.C. that had a parade. Right. His family right. is fighting over all of this blood money yeah, yeah. that mm-hmm. was left over, not from being a great owner or a great mm-hmm. civic steward, just literally from your cable television bill over the last 30 <laughs> years that they've puffed yeah. this thing out. You know, he bought the team for $173 million. And when I wrote the Peter Principles about 15 years ago, mm-hmm. um, I sat with lots and lots of folks that were up in the courtroom in New York. And you can Google Peter Principles. That's L-E-S. <laughs> not. Um, and I thought that was a great title for, you know, what the Peter Principle represents. But he got $45 million in cash mm-hmm. in the deal. Mm-hmm. So it really wasn't a $173 million deal. It was a $173 million price with $45 million of cash that was right. in the business that came with it. So he bought mm-hmm. this thing for about $120 million. Mm-hmm. And it's now worth well in excess of $2 billion. Right. What have you learned from a reportorial standpoint as far as we know there's bad blood, mom's on John's mm-hmm. side. I'm trying to figure out if I'm team John or team Lou at this point. <laughs> You know, if they, I, I'm sort of Switzerland in this. It's hard to pick so- sides. You know, you think of your own family, like, what are they going to do at Thanksgiving? You know, it, it just, yeah. So, yeah, the team is worth, I think the last estimate was pretty close to $2 billion. So it seems like there's plenty of money there. And so why are you fighting over this? You know, why are you, uh, why is all your money eventually going to go to lawyers? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's unfortunate, but it's not unprecedented. You know, there are tons of, uh, uh, you know, I, I also covered the Paterakis family feud over his fortune. Ooh, that, and that was, was a, right, right. And that was, you know, the second wife versus the children. This one, it's, you know, the biological family. There are only four of them. And the three, you know, inheritors are, are fighting over this. Um, you know, I, the, all we see is what happens in the courtroom and what happens in the court documents. You know, so I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. But it just seems like there is a lot of uh, family uh, issues that are being played out through the vehicle of money. It's interesting to me because one of the reasons they threw me out and Greg Bader threw me out is they knew I was a real reporter. They knew I grew up next to you and Rodericks and I had real <laughs> leaders at Ernie Imhoff's in that newsroom and Jim right, Days right. and the great Jack Lemon and the people oh, that, that Jack Gibbons and Marty Kaiser. <laughs> I, mean, I go through all these people and this <laughs> legacy of Tim Kirchian and Ken Rosenthal and, <laughs> you know, writing truths about the right. baseball team when it was a big deal. The the amazing part for me is they were always dysfunctional. They were always Mm -hmm. astray. John was in the family. John was out of the family. Peter Mm -hmm. hated John. Peter let John back in. John sold the rights off to the FM gypsies, and Peter Mm -hmm. came in and brought it back to AM. Like, all Mm -hmm. all of this happened. None Mm -hmm. of it was really reported by your newspaper or anyone else because everyone's intimidated because he'll take your app and press pass. He will. Uh, And he he won't (laughs) let you around. So I would just say this. Everything about their um, dysfunction Mm -hmm. was private, and part of it was – we don't talk about John. We don't talk about Lou. We don't talk about family Mm -hmm. issues. Let's talk about the free agents. Let's talk about the tickets Mm -hmm. we're selling. Let's talk about our television package. Let's talk about our cable Mm -hmm. bill. And I I found it unbelievably sort of tawdry. A year ago, when all of this started bleeding out, Mm -hmm. and I started – I was on an airplane when this happened. I remember Mm -hmm. downloading it. At an airport, I was in Atlanta, and I, I put it on my phone, mm-hmm. and I read it for an hour and a half, and it mm-hmm. was whatever, 80 pages of right. just pointing back and forth, and he right. said, mom did this, and the boy, uh, dad didn't like mm-hmm. you, dad didn't like that you weren't a lawyer, and like all of that that mm-hmm. went on. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, he's out of commission right now, and mm-hmm. they are dragging every single thing that mm-hmm. an enterprise reporter or myself mm-hmm. would have made public if we had talked to friends of the friends down at the Four Seasons mm-hmm. where Brady Anderson was running around, and I just found it to be like, this is Peter's worst nightmare that this has become public in any way. If it was yeah. in a publication, he'd say, oh, you journalists are all liars. You're, ma- you're making it up. You don't like me. This is them accusing each other in court documents, yeah. and I have found the reading of it, and I know you've read through it and reported on it, mm-hmm. that it is so... um 
disrespectful to him, <laughs> you know, to some degree. Right. And I don't know that they know or care. And there's $2 billion. The fact that mm -hmm. they can't all take a billion dollars and go to their corner and get the hell out of the courtroom mm -hmm. and figure it out, sell the team because mom wants to sell the team now. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, update me on what you were reporting a couple of weeks ago, because quite frankly, I've lost the ball. <laughs> in the weeds through this because i yeah. i don't care mm -hmm. i just want right. to find a new owner and whatever but from a cd standpoint and from a reportorial standpoint every nightmare that peter never because peter was peter was so private he hasn't shown his face mm -hmm. with the orioles since 1995 the last time mm -hmm. he did anything where he came before the mm -hmm. franchise was the night that ripkin broke the record uh -huh. he gave a nine minute speech he was mm -hmm. booed horrifically horrific mm -hmm. go watch the video horrifically mm -hmm. booed. when masson shows it they 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 snip it out they snip they mm -hmm. edit the actual speech mm -hmm. it's just nine and a half minutes long i transcribed it at one point because i have a copy of it and he was getting lustily booed uh -huh. for yeah. three or four minutes to the point where frank robinson came off of the line behind him and grabbed him and said you might want to wrap this up <laughs> and and that was the one time peter front faced yeah you know, mm -hmm. out at the stadium where he came out and said, I'm the owner and I'm mm -hmm. going to speak. He hasn't spoken since 1995 about any mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, here's the thing. They are private citizens. And so throughout the coverage of this lawsuit, I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of family uh, dirty laundry that gets aired. You know, any family, I think, if they were, uh, you know, in the public spotlight, there would be some embarrassing things. But I feel like they... You know, when you own a sports team, people have a sense of ownership of that sports team. That's entirely false. It's a private enterprise. These are private people who bought a private company. And, you know, just because they're the Baltimore Orioles doesn't mean, you know, I mean, we feel this sense of ownership because, you know, they're our team. But, you know, they are, they're like any private enterprise. They're like Under Armour. They're like, you know, some guy owns whatever, Sparrow Point. Um, you know, so I feel like they didn't ask to be a public family. And this lawsuit thrust them into that. And, you know, that was someone's decision. And now that it's out there, it's out there. But to me, what's, uh, what's interesting about the lawsuit is not so much the, the dirty laundry, but what happens to some major institutions in town? You know, whatever you think of Peter Angelos, he created from nothing an empire that now includes a major league sports franchise a law firm that has won billions of dollars, uh, you know, it enriched him, but it also, you know, uh, get, my father worked in Bethlehem Steel. So, I mean, I'm very right, familiar right. with all the asbestos. Yeah. 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 And the tobacco uh, litigation that he did on behalf of the state against the, all the people that were ended up, you know, with lung cancer because of smoking. So, uh, you know, that is uh, the law firm is also a major institution in town. Plus he owns a substantial, portion of downtown and we don't know what's going to happen to downtown you know post the pandemic post people working from home but here's someone who you know whose reach was vast and it's fascinating to me what happens now you know there uh, at issue is will the law firm be sold will it be dissolved you know the 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 baseball team will they will it be split up will pieces of it be sold will the whole thing be sold so we're sort of the lawsuit in many ways is this sort of referendum or this sort of signal as to what's going to you know what's the next step for the these major institutions in town and we don't know we don't know what's going to happen I, I can only hope the end is nigh, uh, you know, with all of this. And at some point there will be new own there will be new ownership at some point. I think I'm I'm pretty convinced of that, that the league is not gonna let these kids mm -hmm. and this goofy family run it, that there will be something that will happen that will be triggered upon his death, right? But mom yeah. owns the team though, right? Like that that that's yeah, yeah mom owns the team now that dad's not yeah. operating. So yeah. if she wants to sell, she mm -hmm. will. Where's the end of the what's what's the What's the crux of the, for people who haven't read a yeah. hundred pages of this, mm -hmm, right, set right. it up for us, Gene. Well, okay. So Peter Angelos, of course, bought the team, uh, what was that, 19, 
August 13th, 1992. Very excellent, excellent. You win um, uh, the trivia round for Baltimore. But uh, yeah, Actually, so 93, my it, bad, my bad. Yeah, so he bought that with partners. You know, Tom Clancy was involved. Uh, the, Sam the Shriver, Jim McKay, player. Sergeant yeah, Shriver, yeah. all that, yep. And so apparently the Angel uh, Peter Angelos owns about two thirds of the team. So 60 something percent of the team. So that's what's at stake here. It's still the majority, you know, but there are a bunch of different, you know, the estate of Tom Clancy still owns a piece of it. So they own two thirds of the team. He bought pieces of it back. I, I spoke to uh-huh. um, uh, Jim McKay's son, Sean McManus, <laughs> who runs CBS. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Sean told me Peter made an offer to his family right. after McKay right. died and he bought it back. I know Pam Shriver mm-hmm. sold her a piece. I think Steve yeah. Jeppy's out, even though he's sort of oh, still there. Uh-huh. I don't think he really owns yeah. a piece of the team anymore, from my mm-hmm. understanding. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, it doesn't matter yeah. to the court, right? I mean, to the right. court, this is he said, she said, or they said, mm-hmm. he said in this right, case. right. John and mom versus mm-hmm. Lou, right? Kind of, sort right. of. And mm-hmm. what what are they asking? What what are they trying to? Well, accomplish? you know, mom has been trying to sell the team, or she wants to prepare for an eventual sale of the team, and so she's enlisted Goldman Sachs, all sorts of you know bankers, lawyers to sort of. I don't know if it's, you know, you put together, uh, it's like when you sell a house, you put together what it is that you have on offer. So she has done that, but we have been told by sources, uh, this is from a story that Jeff Barker wrote, that John would like to maintain a majority stake in the team that's and not maybe a sell off. That's, that's not a shot. Yeah. And the brother's accusing him of keeping the stake to move the team to Nashville. Right, right. And I think you first know, reported by me, by the way, uh, about four <laughs> years ago. And everybody's like, oh, that na- he don't like it. Right. Right. She's just making yeah. stuff up. And then the court papers came out. I was on the plane. I turned to my wife. I'm yeah. like, oh, <laughs> my see, God. The see. brother is accusing the other brother of doing exactly right. what I've been reporting for three years. So, you know, two, yeah, two points think, for me in those yeah. cowboy boots for John right. down in Nashville. <laughs> but I think a lot of things get said in a lawsuit to, to score various political points. And John has sworn that the team is not leaving. So who do you believe? Uh, you know, I think uh, Lou has just intimated that this is part of John's, you know, overall plan. And this is why he's trying to consolidate you know, control of the team. Well, and at the very least, to leverage Nashville <laughs> against Baltimore, there is no long-term lease. So, and right. I've also learned that, you know, Steve Bishotti, uh, who has mm-hmm. recently excommunicated me from the media after 26 years, <laughs> thinks he has at least, um, that, that his stake in mm-hmm. the Civic Project per the mm-hmm. Maryland Stadium Authority, and I've been to Wrigleyville and seen what they've done mm-hmm. in Chicago. I've been down to Atlanta where they built a whole neighborhood. Right. I've been to all of these stadium projects because mm-hmm. it's what I do. And understanding where gambling is, where mm-hmm. mixed development is, where entertainment districts are, and they got a golf thing going on down mm-hmm. there, a casino that wasn't there before, that mm-hmm. whatever parcels of land and parking lots that can become what Philadelphia has with their little live bar that sits between the, the, the stadia up mm-hmm. there, that whatever the future of the Camden Yards Entertainment District will mm-hmm. be, Steve's kind of tied to whatever this wacky baseball family does right. based on going to the state and getting two long-term leases. Mm-hmm. The Ravens lease is up in four years. It's uh, been 30 years. 1998. Yeah. We're, we're That's there. hard to believe. 23 yeah. right now, right? We're getting mm-hmm. there. That the Orioles are now out of lease. We're mm-hmm. in the 32nd year, 33rd year yeah. going into yeah, we're for the on, Orioles. Um, I the, think a one-year extension of some well, sort. The long-term which expires lease next year. is really mm-hmm. the secret yeah. and the honeypot. Yeah. And if John Angelos had full control of this to twist mm-hmm. Nashville into Baltimore, mm-hmm. it's going to cost yeah. West more and more money and, and, <laughs> and, and Annapolis yeah. more money to keep the Orioles here. Yeah. I mean, if I were a gambling person, I would bet they're going to sign a lease. I mean, there's 600, uh, what is it, $600 million that the state is going to give them for improvements if they sign a long-term lease. And whatever lease. they give the Orioles, they have to give the Ravens, which was right. all part of so the poison they, pill back yeah, in the 90s, yeah. yes. Right, right. And the condition of that is you sign a long-term lease uh, with a no, a no uh, get-out-of-town clause. You know, uh, well, which right is now what the get out of town now. clause doesn't exist, and I think that that plays into lose litigation in, mm. in regard. They may be trying to get fans to say he's trying to take the team or whatever. Right, right. But my issue as a journalist and as a citizen mm-hmm. and even as a fan is, 
if the team's going to be here for the next 30 years, mm-hmm. go, go, go down to West, right. cut your best deal and let's yeah. keep the team here. You, you know, yeah. let's yeah. sell the team conditioned upon mm-hmm. it must remain in Baltimore right. as opposed to right. you're buying franchise X with sort of an open loop yeah. <laughs> to take the team wherever you want to take yeah. it, which, and, and listen, mm-hmm. you've been here a long time. We mm-hmm. fought to keep the baseball team, right? I mean, right. Baltimore's, the Orioles mm-hmm. were always going to be in DC. Ask anybody that was associated right. with Everman Williams, right? right? We mm-hmm. kept the baseball team. We lured mm-hmm. and stole a football mm-hmm. team and had that built. Mm-hmm. Boy, if Baltimore had to go do that right now, <laughs> if we had to go steal a baseball or a football team, <laughs> yeah, right, right. 2022, if we, we wouldn't have yeah. the currency to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Major League Baseball, I think their interest is keeping the team here in Baltimore. We're an original Major League city. You know, why would Major League Baseball want to see the Bore- uh, Orioles, you know, get in a Mayflower van and head to Nashville? You know, so a lot of forces are in play to keep the team in town, regardless of who owns it. What happens so. at the end here? Well, you said that we're not near the end of this. I mean, you were the one in the courtroom, so you tell <laughs> me where surprised. the end of this is. Dude. Yeah, I mean, it could settle tomorrow. Uh, you know, they, they're, it is such an opaque process. Only the people, you know, behind closed doors really know what's going on. But my sense is that there must be, uh, you know, it's about money. So there must be a number, right? Or there must be, there must be something that would get the two sides together. They, um, you know, they're under court ordered mediation. I, I think that kicks in at a certain point if they're still, you know, apart. And uh, there's always a chance, you know, most cases like this generally settle out of court. You know, there's no reason to go into the courthouse and rip each other to sh- shreds, you know, forever. They seem it's, like they're enjoying it thus far. Yeah, but, you know, not everyone is like you and me, the nerds who will read 80 pages of court documents. So a lot of it, you know, hasn't really played out in open court to date. It's mainly been lawyers arguing about each other. But as soon as, you know, the last hearing, uh, Georgia Angelos and Lou Angelos were there. They were prepared to testify. And the judge said, no, I can make my ruling without it, without their testimony. And people seemed a little disappointed. But Maybe at a certain point that will happen. And I think once there's a prospect of Georgia Angelos on the stand, you know, talking smack about her son, I mean, that's just such a horrifying prospect. I feel like you thought that was going to happen three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've covered court cases when uh, someone sits in the hallway, you know, because they're not supposed to be listening to what's going on in the courthouse, you know, they're, you expect them to testify. And in fact, when uh, the judge, didn't call any witnesses. One of Georgia's lawyers said, oh, Mrs. Angelos is here and perfectly uh, you know, willing to answer any questions you have. And the judge was like, no, that's not necessary. Something along those lines. And Lou was there as well. I didn't see John, um, you know, uh, but there, you know, one of the motions recently was for John to join in with um, Georgia on one of her motions. So it seems like John wants to, you know, be in on this, whether he wants to testify or not, who knows, but that could, that would be, you know, that would be like Perry Mason. I Do think, you know, you know that we're, we're, we're reconnected coming. the day that that's mm-hmm. going to happen. Please text mm-hmm. me. I'll bring crab cakes. I'll bring popcorn. <laughs> right. You know, I'll do whatever I need to do at this point. And uh, a little bit of <laughs> angst on my part after having my career taken away 17 years ago. <laughs> Jean Marbell is here. She's from the Baltimore Sun. She does great things there. You can follow her out on Twitter. I do mm-hmm. as well. Uh, she's been doing this a long, long time. 35 years at the Baltimore Sun. Mm-hmm. Let's get off baseball, football, sports. all that. Let's talk sure. a little bit about newspapers. I mean, Obviously, some of your um, your former colleagues are at the banner. I've had some right. of them on. I have Dan mm-hmm. coming on Friday. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember a two newspaper town. I'm a news yeah, American yeah. guy, as you remember, <laughs> from back in 84 and 85. Right. Um, the state of journalism and the fact that you've dedicated your life to this, mm-hmm. I have dedicated my life mm-hmm. to it for better or worse, maybe a little more radio entertainment mm-hmm. side. But my father, when he died in um, July 1992, my father died very angry at me uh, at the end of oh. his life. And he was so mad at me because I left the sun. Uh, I left the sun in Uh-oh. January 92 and he said to me, you're going to get a gold watch. You'll be there the rest. You got a job for the rest of your life. You're going to have a <laughs> And here 30 years later, what's happened to journalism. And I am, mm-hmm. I am such a heart newspaper guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm good with digital. I'm good with all that. I don't yeah. grab the paper and read it, but anytime mm-hmm. I do, when I touch it, it's something that means right. a lot to me. Right. And seeing this second thing come in, 
mm-hmm. at a time when there needs to be more opinions and more reporting mm-hmm. and the, the 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 size of the sun obviously shrinking over the mm-hmm. last 30 years what's what's journalism for you at this point i mean what what gets yeah. you out of bed in the morning as a reporter to make this thing happen yeah. and report on things like this that are important to the community yeah yeah for me, the job has always been the same. It's just the sort of vessel or the vehicle by which your stories, you know, reach eyeballs. And so uh, for me, my job really hasn't changed that much, except for, you know, now we're feeding both the digital beast and the print beast. And, uh, you know, I must say the sun, I mean, yeah, uh, the industry as a whole is not in a good place. But the Sun is doing quite well. You know, our digital subscriptions are doing really well. And that, of course, is the future. And that would help us if we would get more digital subscriptions. And, you know, even if it's at the expense of print ones, because that saves us ink and paper and gas for the trucks to go driving all over town. So, um, sorry. No worries. <laughs> I will talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's in a good place in that, yeah, the digital revolution really changed how we do business. But when you look at the landscape now, who do you trust online? Do you trust some guy, you know, who you never heard of, who has no affiliation? Or do you trust someone like Nestor, who everyone's name, whose name has been around town for decades, the Baltimore Sun, who's been here for, you know, more than a century. And in fact, you know, the Angelo story, I will always remember the day it broke because that was the night we were having a party to celebrate the Sun's 185th birthday. (laughs) So I was responsible for maybe four or five people missing the big party. (laughs) I remember the 150, by the way. I worked there during the the 150. That was enormous. That was like, (laughs) Reg Murphy was all about that, Gene, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came later that year. Yeah, but everyone still talked about it. There was the the poster and everyone went on whatever boat that was in the harbor. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's always going to be a need. Like no city can get along without, you know, journalists. I mean, how, how does anyone know what's going on? And for from reliable people. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, the banner, it, it's, it's, it's quite impressive that they have this new model. We'll see if it, you know, how long it sticks around, if it, if there's a market for that. Um, but, you know, the more the merrier. I think, you know, competition in the olden days, you know, as you say, there was a News American, there was an Evening Sun, there were, you know, competition is always good, I think. You know, you can get very lax um, if you're the only game in town, so... Well, even I, think, the, I showed up yeah. at the Sun in 86, right? January 86, uh-huh. a little before you. And mm-hmm. there was a famous story of Mike Davis and Marty Kaiser fighting mm-hmm. in the newsroom ah, over, a picture, over a picture of the Mayflower van. It was the night of the Mayflower van <laughs> yeah, happening. As to, because it was the Sun papers had photographers, but the evening uh-huh. Sun and the morning Sun, I don't want to say we didn't like each other, but... Uh-huh. If an Evening Sun reporter had a scoop, they weren't sharing it with the morning paper in the morning. (laughs) They were holding it, right? So there was even competition within competition. Oh, totally. Yeah. Back then, you know, we shared certain resources, like we shared the library and maybe the photo staff. Thank God for Paul in the library in the morning, right? right? Paul is still there. Paul Paul McCardle, I love you. Paul McCardle, yeah. (laughs) Paul McCardle is the keeper, the keeper of the flame, the keeper of all institutional knowledge. But yeah, you would go to the library and you wanted the clips on something that happened at the school board. And you would find out that like, an evening sun reporter had those clips and you're like what is he working on so yeah there was within the building there was some real you know yeah brother it's like a civil war essentially well when journalists compete you win out there as the public <laughs> Gene, Mar- Gene Marvell is here uh, from the Baltimore Sun all right last thing for you um mm-hmm. n- new government uh Westmore I- I'm still in a state of shock to some degree, all this these years later, and you, you mentioned mm-hmm. trusted resources. I thought mm-hmm. after Trump that the, the, the thing that will be the truth over the next 10 or 15 mm-hmm. years, especially for young people, is seeking trusted people, trusted mm-hmm. resources mm-hmm. you know, out in the world. Um, mm-hmm. And 
I'm I, I stand astonished that a Republican ran the state for eight years, right? Like right. that that right. any state that's 70, 75 percent mm-hmm. Democratic that Larry Hogan won once, he won twice. Mm-hmm. This Westmore thing and the pro Baltimore thing mm-hmm. and the red line being killed and a governor for eight years who acted like Baltimore was somewhere in Virginia or right. Pennsylvania right. or Delaware. Mm-hmm. The fact that there will be a focus on Baltimore. One of the reasons mm-hmm. Baltimore's falling apart is not enough people are focused on it. Mm-hmm. Um, because if we did, we could and we shall mm-hmm. and we will. Mm-hmm. Wes and the new regime mm-hmm. and this particular election, which probably looks more like an election from 30 or 40 years ago, if you're talking mm-hmm. about Democrats mm-hmm. sort of putting their foot down in the state and saying, we're, we're not having um, mm-hmm. fake news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, that was quite a stunning victory. And I think it took a, a day or two for people to realize, wait a minute, we'll have a Democratic mayor at City Hall, we'll have a Democratic mayor in Annapolis, we have a Democratic president in uh, the White House. It's like, let's get some stuff done. You know, this is like a, an alignment for a city like Baltimore, which, you know, spent, uh, wasted a lot of time, you know, in fights with Donald Trump calling it a rat hole and, you know, with Larry Hogan, as you say. Uh, well, not you know, to mention he, some mayors going to prison too. That Yeah, you're right. Oh, just, just a few, one or two, one or two here and there. So, yeah, I think there's, um, there's actually some hope for the future you know i i i'm uh, afraid to say that because you know in baltimore you, you get used to being you know smacked down you pop up and you say oh look something good you know so but you know it, 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 a fresh start can be good here i would say this there's a lot of people that kick the sun around in town for whatever <laughs> right. whatever their politics or whatever like the orioles no 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 i'll just for. say i, I want to give give it where it's straight i mean if there were no Baltimore Sun, if there were no real reporters like yourself and your staff, mm-hmm. and I'll give Fenton and anybody at the Banner, Pam Wood, mm-hmm. any of those people credit to say that bringing down the Gun Trace Task Force, bringing down Mayors yeah. for Healthy Holly, mm-hmm. and I'm just talking, that's in the last five years, right? right. But these yeah. things don't happen, you know, institutionally. Yeah. I mean, Kathy Pugh had that thing all set up with a bunch of rich people that it would yeah. never come out. And now it came mm-hmm. out and embarrassed some friends of mine, quite frankly, for mm-hmm. their involvement in it. That mm-hmm. that doesn't happen without people like you, serious people, and without your institution and the institutions yeah. that are the guardrails for democracy, the guardrails <laughs> for making sure that whatever Wes is doing, whatever Brandon's doing, it's on the up and up. And um, And I mm-hmm. think they should have a healthy – not respect, but they should have a healthy fear right. of the truth in journalists that right. we are going to report what's really yeah. happening, not what you're paying yeah. us off to not say or making us cough and look in the other direction. Um, I'm appreciative, you know, all because mm-hmm. I've had a love hate with the sun over the course of oh, years. Yeah. And one Everyone we all has. have right one way or another. <laughs> right. Um, and I remember some things written about me that I didn't think were fair, or honest or certainly not accurate mm-hmm. uh, over the course of time. But there is an importance in what you do, what institutions Mm do, that, yeah, we're all clapping for West now and he might be president. He might do. all. But in Mm -hmm. the meantime, let's let's hold these people accountable Mm -hmm. for making the place better. And I think that that's the role of journalists everywhere. Yeah, Yeah. man, that should be our mission statement. You know, we're the watchdogs, Um, you know, and I I think it's human nature. If, If no one's watching you, there's this tendency to like, you know misbehave here a little bit here a little bit there so yeah yes you know we're all human and we all need to a little bit of scrutiny what are you working on next promote something oh my god you know i'm working on a story it's it's a nice story uh fort meade where all the spies are all the all the the nsa all the intelligence uh people they have realized that that job can be it takes quite a mental toll on people you know you're you're sitting in a room at a computer waging war basically uh halfway around the globe then you come home and your your wife says honey what how was your day well you can't say boo Um, i have a buddy that's (laughs) nsa for life and i literally texted with him yesterday yeah i have never ever ever had a conversation Mm -hmm. with him Like, what, what did you do today? Yeah. yeah. And, and I know so, they do not even ask him because he can't tell me anyway. Right, right. And so they're starting this new center that's going to open on Thursday. That'll be like a, a resource for like if you're you're having trouble sleeping, you're having trouble with your girlfriend, you know, something is wrong. Uh, you know, here's somewhere you can go confidentially, get help and whatever. Because, you know, if you work in that field, there's always this fear that if you were to seek psychiatric help, psychological help, 
suddenly you'll lose your clearance, you'll lose your job. And so this is a very confidential, you know, low key place to go and just say, hey, I'm having trouble with X. What do you think? And they'll they'll find you a counselor, a, a yoga class, whatever. So that they come yeah, do yoga with me if they want. Oh God, are you a yoga? Are you a hot? Oh, yoga? I'm a. I am full on. Yeah, I've been full uh, on for twenty years. Yeah, I'm bendy. Oh man, no, oh, I got it. <laughs> we'll do that one day. Please, please. Yes. Jamar Belly here from the Baltimore Sun. She's a columnist, enterprise writer, and most importantly, a reporter. She went to a good school, uh, and she's been here for 35 years doing it. I hope you guys follow her out. Uh, she's obviously been working on the uh, the Angelos family uh, mysteries, uh, as uh, they are. Hey, uh, next courtroom for them? And this thing got pushed off a couple weeks ago. When's the next yeah. thing? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if it's been rescheduled. There was supposed to be something last week, and, you know, like everything, you know, like reporters, they asked for an extension. <laughs> Put it off till after the holidays. We can all have a meal and give some gifts. Right, right. It was great having you on. Please, it was really great to have you on. Stay in touch. I always like having the old colleagues. And you remember me from being a kid back, right? I mean, I was a mess when I was a kid, right? No, I mean, I just remember you were like you are now, except, you know, you were bouncing off walls. You were, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Sandy McKee would say the same thing, and I shared her desk, so. (laughs) Gene, thank you very much. Keep up the great work. We'll keep reading, keep uh, subscribing, and uh, certainly keep following you on social media thanks a bunch crab cake next time gene's gonna be upset with me i'm giving crab cakes to dan rogers on friday <laughs> uh, we're gonna be out of pappas doing the maryland crab cake tour presented by the maryland lottery in conjunction with our friends at window nation and goodwill that'll be friday dan rogers david Steele, two baltimore sun alums uh, i didn't work with david at the sun but i did work with dan i've also fly fished with dan 10 o'clock two o'clock 10 o'clock two o'clock so i'm gonna make dan tell a bunch of lefty cray stories as well on friday <laughs> which are always my favorites and we're also gonna be joined by mike bordick Adam Kalarik and Frank Kalarik from League of Dreams. Catonsville coming together in uh, with Dundalk in Cockeysville. We'll be at Pappas 2 to 5. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking. Baltimore, positive. <laughs>